Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name is B, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm really delighted to be with you again, and I feel like I'm home because uh, there's so many people here I've known for a long, 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 long time. And uh, and then I noticed that you flew in some Irish fellows too. <laughs> Not great. Uh, the Irish is kind of pick up here today, so if you don't understand us, you'll have to get somebody to interpret. Except that uh, I come from the northern part of Ireland, so um, I'm the one who finds it really difficult to see spiting everything and everybody. <laughs> part of my disease. Uh, I want to thank um, Gary for inviting me. I don't know why you'd be inviting me again, and uh, by the grace of God, I haven't found it necessary to go out and drink again, so my story is the same. And um, so those of you who are tired listening to me, you can just nod off, because I understand you had a very late night last night. So I won't take it personally, and uh, so just uh, relax here. Uh, My life was fine until I was two. And um, if you, you know, um, take a look at me and you'll know that this is going to be a long story and it's hot in here. So when I was two, my sister was born and uh, she moved into my spot in the universe, which is the center. And um, if you want to ever read about me, I'm on page 62 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, it, it just felt to me that I was being pushed to the edges of the family when she was born. And then there was a boy born, and then two more girls. And it seemed every time a new child came into the family, um, my space was taken. And uh, when I was eight years old, my father went to work one day, and he never came home because he uh, was killed in an accident. And um, what I remember about that was that um, my mother took me aside and she said, Bree Jean, because that's my name, I want you to help me to raise these children. And um, I was the oldest of five. And if you're new and you're wondering why I'm talking about this, what the big book says is that alcohol is but the symptom of our problems. What we have to do is we have to get down to the causes and conditions. And my problem generally in my almost 17 years of sobriety has been that um, I would do the causes real well, but I didn't mix it up with the conditions, which I think are my character defects. I didn't know I had any until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. But um, anyhow, um, what my mother taught me uh, as a widowed woman in Ireland who was a school teacher and had five little children, the oldest being eight, to take care of and rear all by herself. What she taught me was somewhere, I think it's page 60 where it says, or 61, and it says something like this, is she not a victim of the delusion that she can rest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if she only manages well. I thought my job in the world was to learn how to manage well. One time I looked up the word rest in the dictionary, W-R-E-S-T, and the definition I found was to push and pull in a violent fashion. Do any of you here ever rest besides me? (laughs) Um, almost everything I do, I want to do in a violent fashion. Um, somebody gave me a keychain once and it said, born to struggle. <laughs> if there's a difficult way to do something, I will usually find that way. And by the grace of God and by the steps of this program, I'm learning an easier, softer way through um, working the steps. And so then I started, you know, going to school and learning stuff and doing all that thing you do, you know. And when I was in my teenage years, I did what most people do. I started thinking about what I would want to be doing when I grew up. 
Now, I need to let you know right now that that has not happened for me yet. <laughs> not yet. But if I stick around you, I may have a chance of this happening. And so what I decided to do was I decided to become a saint. And you've just heard chapter 5 being read, and you heard that awful sentence that it says, we're not saints, we're trying to grow along these spiritual lines. And I have to let you know that my feelings were very, very offended and hurt when I first got into Alcoholics Anonymous, when I would hear these kinds of things. And I was going to be like a, a large saint, you know, a big one, and uh, you'd know about me and read about me and look at pictures of me, and I was going to be wonderful. So what I decided to do was to become a Catholic nun. And I've been doing Catholic nunny stuff now for almost for, for almost 45 years. And, um, you know, uh, well, actually, two weeks from now, two weeks from today. And wh what I sometimes say to groups like this, I say, if you've been doing celibacy that long, you'd be kind of counting, too. <laughs> but um, a long time. Um, what I what I always uh, say though now is that um, my life is wonderful and it has been and it's a wonderful vocation I have and uh, what I like to do at this point is crowd this large is to say to you I just wouldn't I wouldn't have any clue why this number of you would be wanting to spend a Sunday morning listening to a Catholic nun I just don't know I, I just presume immediately that you have a resentment against me <laughs> And, and what I want to tell you is that I didn't do it to you. <laughs> but, but I want to say, too, that I would like to, on the more serious side of things, I would like to publicly make amends for any of you who have been hurt by people like me. If any of you have ever not been listened to, have ever been punished unjustly, have ever felt humiliated, by anybody in my walk of life, I want to tell you that I'm really sorry that that happened. I belong to a human church, as every church is, and um, sometimes I find people in the program who carry the burden of that around with them for a long, long time, and I like to take the opportunity of publicly making amends when I can for anybody who may be still carrying some of that burden. And so I entered this um, community of sisters, and um, they sent me, eventually sent me over to England to finish my education, and I did that. And um, when I was all done, I just knew a little bit about everything. You know, I just was very smart. I used to be very smart. <laughs> and then, you know, I was teaching in England for a while, and then a letter came to our convent one day, and it said, would any of you like to volunteer to go to California? Well, I just knew that I belonged in Hollywood anyhow, so I signed up. <laughs> In those olden days, and I got picked, and I was sent out here. And I had to go back to Ireland to do all my paperwork from England. And when I was leaving, my superior said to me, we're going to put you in charge. And um, I don't think there's anything an alcoholic likes to hear better than they're going to be put in charge. <laughs> we, we do it in different kinds of ways. The book talks about running the show, arranging the lights, the ballet, and so on. And uh, we do it until they all start misbehaving, and then we start blaming them. That's part of our problem. And so I was sent to Southern California, and I arrived there on the 16th of August, 1964. And it was a day like this, very hot, and we were dressed in all the nunny garb. You've seen pictures of people like us, probably on the bottle of blue nun wine. Some of you might have seen that. <laughs> You know, all, all this surge around us and white, you know, white starch around our heads. And it was very, very hot in Southern California where I arrived. And, um, but I was in charge. So everything was fine for about five days and it was going well. And then I met a man and he was called the pastor. 
and he had this idea that he was in charge. I would never know where he got the idea, but he did. And immediately we started to kind of lock horns and kill each other uh, privately, if you know what I mean. And I planned his demise in my mind. I really wanted to get rid of him very badly. And I started to get really uncomfortable inside and a lot of little lonely, orphaned, unresolved things, feelings came into me again and I, I just was all bent out of shape and I was very unhappy and I was not, wasn't going the way it was supposed to. And then a miracle happened for me, a miracle happened and I think it happened for you too because if it hadn't happened probably we would never have met here today. And that was that I got my first drink. The miracle was that this lady brought us, invited all of us over to her swimming pool and we got all the nunnies into the big long station wagon that we had and we went over to her swimming pool and we swam. And when we were all finished, she brought this great big tray and a large big jug pitcher and some glasses. And on the top of the glasses there was salt. And um, just have a hunch that you might have known what was in the pitcher. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, when I took my, I was going to say a sip, but I didn't know how to sip, you know, I, I wasn't a sipper. I, I gulped, you know, a big, large draft of this great stuff. And I had my very first spiritual awakening. <laughs> you know, my neck all sort of relaxed, and my shoulders, and my back, and my knees, and I just thought, this is wonderful. And I have to ask her to give me the recipe. <laughs> and so she gave me the recipe to take home and I thought the nicest thing that I could do for these nunny bunnies that I worked with and who worked so hard for me would be to whip it up as soon as I could ever get the ingredients <laughs> and uh, so I would do that and um, I remember one day the pastor came over and he said to me he was a good man really but I didn't care for him very much because he wanted to be in charge. And um, he said to me, is there anything that you people need here? He was very good to us. And I said, well, yes. As a matter of fact, we would like to have a bottle of tequila, please. <laughs> I, was all, I will always remember his face. He looked at me like, you know, this is really different. Uh, and he went away and he brought back this bottle of tequila and um, I think he got it where the manufactured it, but I'm not really sure about this, in the rectory where he lived because he seemed to have a, quite a supply there. And then he brought it over <laughs> and then he invited us to, to join them over there for a little barbecue the next weekend. And I made a great discovery and that was that they had other things besides margaritas. They had scotch and bourbon and wine and a wonderful thing called after-dinner drinks, like Brandy Alexander's. And oh, wouldn't they just slip down so nicely after you've, you know, you just, I just felt so classy and so with it. And um, this will not mean much to most of you, but in those years, there was a kind of a movement happening in the Catholic Church. It was called Vatican II. And um, some, of, some of you heard about it, but what, what happened was that the Pope said, let's just get some fresh air into this church. And uh, he sort of opened the windows symbolically, and um, he told people like us to sort of start mingling with the people more and not to be so much apart from. And what, what I really thought he meant was that we could drink. That's what I thought. <laughs> and I wanted to obey the Pope more than I wanted to do anything. <laughs> And um, so I joined all kinds of committees and uh, extracurricular activities so that in the end, eventually, that I could have my little drinky poo because it was just so important to me. It, it was becoming very important, but I didn't know that. And I noticed right from the word go that the sisters didn't drink like I did. They would say strange things like, let's have the little glasses. Now that's strange for people like us. We uh, don't do little anything. We always want more of whatever it is. And um, they, they did something else that I thought was very strange. They would never finish. And I still don't understand people who don't finish alcohol. It's just uh, incredible. You know, they just kind of, it's not very polite, I don't think. <laughs> And they didn't finish. And uh, I can always remember going around after them to sort of 
take their leftovers so that I could store it away for a rainy day. And there were plenty of rainy days in my life. I didn't know. I was always, when I was drinking, I was always thinking, where am I going to get the next one? When can this happen again so that it won't look like I'm doing what I'm doing? And I was filled with guilt and shame and remorse. As a matter of fact, the way I defined it to myself, I really believed that I was living in sin. I had, I had absolutely no idea that I had a disease, none whatsoever. I had never, I had known about alcoholism and I'd known about alcoholics, but I just thought there were people who didn't have very much willpower and uh, that just didn't know how, and I used to kind of give it up by myself, like some of us have done, you know, and gosh, white knuckling it for a while, and then always the inevitable. It was really hard. Um, Mexico was one of my favorite places to drink. Um, there was this fellow who owned a, a trailer down in Estero Beach, and he offered it to us and told us that we could have the keys and use it any time that he wasn't there. And um, he and his wife brought the keys over one day, and he handed me these three keys. I will always remember this. And he said, this is the key of the front door. This is the key of the cabana. And then he held up a tiny little key. And he said, this is the key of the liquor cabinet. Help yourself. And I said, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> and I meant that with all my heart. And I said to the sisters, you know, pretty soon more than 50% of Southern California will be Hispanic. So we better get down there to Mexico and learn how to speak Spanish as often as we can. <laughs> with all the Americans and Canadians in Estero Beach. And so we would go down there a lot. And um, what I would re remember, the sisters would say to me sometimes, do you think we should be drinking his booze? And I'd say, well, we're eating his cereal, aren't we? His feelings will be hurt, you know. His fe we wouldn't want to upset this good man. So um, I can remember, I was very impressed with the United States of America because you have lots of holidays. You have holidays in every single month of the year. You have Labor Day, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, things that we don't always have. We had St. Patrick's Day in Ireland, and, you know, my St. Patrick's Days used to last, you know, long, long St. Patrick's Days, like 10 days before and 10 days after. It usually, it usually came in a time in our church that's called Lent, and I would always try to be good and not drink in Lent. But, oh, Lord, it was hard. All the stuff, you know, that, that uh, all the, the conflict and all the pain and all the doubt and all the confusion that was going on in my head. And I didn't know that I was in the grip of a progressive illness. And I didn't know that I was involved in what the big book says in the doctor's opinion. It calls it the phenomenon of craving. <laughs> I love the way it says that. You know, it's just a strange happening of craving. We can't not crave alcohol except by the grace of God. And I believe that that's what we have here. We have the grace of God. And uh, so what happened then for me was that I slowly started to die inside of me. Now, it was a very lonely death. Uh, I couldn't tell anybody, you know, and uh, my drinking, uh, you know, the sisters, because I was the boss of everything, they were very uh, tactful how they dealt with me. They would say things like, uh, oh my, but you were something last night. Now, I'm not sure exactly to this day what that means for sure. And to tell you the truth, I'm not that interested to know. <laughs> um, I just know that I started to die inside, and when I say that, I always think of page eight in the big book, where Bill Wilson says, um, no words can tell of the loneliness and the bitter morass of self-pity that he found himself in when alcohol had become his master. And he felt that everywhere he walked, that he put his foot into quicksand, and he was sinking, and he was overwhelmed, and he had found his match. Almost everything else that I tried to do, I could do, and I couldn't get the idea of drinking out of my mind. And what I spent a lot of years trying to do was to do what Chapter 3 says we cannot do, and that is I tried to control and enjoy my drinking. Did you ever try to do that? And it never works. You know, if you control your drinking, you can't enjoy it, and if you enjoy your drinking, you can't control it. That, that was my experience.
And uh, I really had no intention of giving up alcohol, you know. I mean, I'd given up everything else, so couldn't I have just this little drink to kind of keep me even, you know, sort of my emotions even, and to feel warm inside. And, and, and I, I never could get to that point where I wanted just to stay there. I always wanted more. And I was, I was killing myself. I was dying, and I was ashamed, and I was afraid, and I was waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was mad at God, and I was, oh, oh, it was dreadful. And uh, one day, um, I stood in our community room in the convent, and I just, off the bookshelf, picked up this little pamphlet that we get, and on the very back page it said, Sister, are you concerned about your drinking? If so, please call this number, collect. And I made a collect phone call to Massachusetts at 9 o'clock at night, and it was midnight their time, and I talked to this woman, and I told her some lies. Uh, I know you have never done things like that, but I have to... <laughs> there are people here who know my story very well, so I have to stay really honest. And uh, I told her some lies, and I told her that I was changing jobs. That part was true, and I was moving from the job I had as a principal of a school and so on, and I was moving from that job into a, a job in the diocese. And I was concerned because a lot of the people with whom I would be working had drinking problems. And could she help me to help them? And she said yes, there was literature, there were even places that people could go where she worked, and she gave me lots of information, and she said she would send me some books, and we had a wonderful conversation, and I just knew if I could read this whole thing correctly, I would know how to do this wonderful thing called control and enjoy your drinking, although I wasn't using that terminology at that point because I hadn't yet found the big book. But anyway, that's what I wanted to do. And just as I was about to hang up the phone, she said to me, Sister, would you like to tell me a little bit about your own drinking? Now, I don't know how they're so smart in Massachusetts. <laughs> she just knew. And she said, it seems to me that you would not be making a collect call from California to Massachusetts at midnight if you were concerned about other people's drinking. And that was another moment of grace for me because I was able to break down and cry into the telephone to this strange voice to whom I'd never spoken before. And I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to tell. I don't know where to go for help. I just, I, and you know, I used to be so important at one time too. I really was, and I was a kind of a public figure, and I didn't want anybody to know, and I was very afraid. And she said, well, why don't you start going to some AA meetings and, and listen, listen for the feelings well, I never really planned, in my script for life, I never planned to go to AA. That never dawned on me at all. However, I could not get her conversation out of my mind, so I called Alcoholics Anonymous the next day, and I found an AA meeting in a place called Whittier that I know some of you have been to. And it was quite a distance from where I live in North Orange County. And um, so at the time, we were wearing a kind of a modified nunny garb, you know, like a habit. And I remember taking that off and putting on regular clothes and dolling myself up and went down to this meeting in Serenity Hall in Whittier on Greenleaf Avenue. And it was a 10 a.m. meeting. And I went in there, and it just seemed to me, now this is just my perspective, doesn't mean to say it's necessarily true, but what I, I seemed to see were a lot of old men just shuffling around the room. You know, they were just, just shuffling. And there were two women there, and one left, and the one who stayed, she was not quite with it. In fact, in Ireland, we say she was not the full shilling. She was just not all there. She would clap at the wrong times, and she would laugh out loud, and she was just really off the wall. And I thought, oh, this is a really scary place for somebody as important as myself to be in, you know? <laughs> this is not what I had in mind, you know? This is not the plan. And then... A fellow got up to the podium. There was a podium, some, something like this, and the serenity prayer was on a drop right down here. And he stood up and he started telling us about his experience, strength, and hope. 
And what was fascinating to me was that he was using a vocabulary that was um, not something that I was used to using on a regular basis, if you know what I mean. He was, um, he was using a word that starts with sh, and then he moved into another one that starts with f. <laughs> Now, I can, I can tell that some of you know your phonics, and that's, that's good. But what was interesting to me was that he was using the f word in sentences and in various parts of speech, like an iron of verb, an adjective, an adverb, a preposition, and a conjunction. And um, he used the f word with ing and with ed on the end, and on one occasion he used it with the word mother before it. And I remember thinking, and this is going to be my spiritual leader for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then we stood at the end and we were saying the Lord's Prayer, and then they said, keep coming back, you know? <laughs> I really didn't, I just couldn't get this whole deal. It was very disconcerting to me. And what I remember was I got into the car to go home and I was crying hard and oh God, I didn't want to be there, I didn't want to, be, oh, it was painful. And uh, I can remember looking at myself in the mirror and uh, in the car and oh Lord, it was just miserable. I'd put on this eye makeup, I remember, to impress everybody in Serenity Hall and Whittier. And it was rolling down my face, you know, it was just awful. Oh. And, um, I said the sh word and the f word all the way home to the convent. <laughs> now, wait. I'm not necessarily advocating that, but, you know, I had to get in touch with a lot of the anger that I was in, a lot of the, oh, just the disillusionment was dreadful. Now, I also know that there's a number of you here in this room today, I know some of you actually, and I know that the moment you walked into Alcoholics Anonymous that you surrendered and you felt at home. You're here, some of you are here. But I always like to tell those of you who did not be like that when you came into Alcoholics Anonymous that I was one of you. I did not want to be there. And I had a big, big problem with this deal called surrender. I have this other little thing, I usually call it like, maybe people from Ireland have it, especially from the north of Ireland, we have it a lot. It's called arrogance. And that means that we know, up there in the north, we know a little bit more than anybody else how to do everything. And we won't be taking direction from anybody either. So they tell you you have to follow directions on this deal, you know. It's hard for somebody like me who's already a saint. You know, it's very hard. <laughs> People in my walk of life don't get this deal because it's too simple. You know, really, it's a, it's a real miracle that I'm standing here sober, thanks be to God. Miracle. Um, and so there were basically at these meetings to which I never wanted to go, never wanted to go to the meetings, uh, they were basically saying some things and they were saying don't drink. Now I got sober on the 2nd of December 1978 and um, Christmas and not drinking, you know Christmas in the convent was one of the few legal times you could drink and they were saying you don't drink and I said well what about Christmas and then this one lady said oh B you don't have to do Christmas yet, Christmas is on the 25th of December and this is only the second or the third, and I think, oh, that's kind of strange conversation. Weird things they tell you, and you hold on, you just hold on, and how do you surrender? You hold on, then how do you do this? You let go, and you're just all mixed up. You not get it. It's awful. Now, I wasn't into drugs because I hadn't met any of you yet, and... Uh, Sometimes have these bad thoughts. I, I really do. You know, I think, God, where were you guys when I was drinking? You know, where were you? I was thinking this about the Irishman I met last night. Where were you when I was drinking? God, we could have had a great time. Maybe not. <laughs> I wouldn't have had so much conflict wondering where I was going to get the next drink. You know, but. Uh, the only drugs that I ever was involved with were prescription drugs. And what happened for me was that I went to the doctor because I was thought I was having a kind of a nervous breakdown, and I told him that. I always told the doctor what I had. And uh, 
he gave me Elevil and Stelazine, and then he graduated me into Librium and Valium. And when you'd swig that down with a little bit of vodka or whatever you get your hands on, it made you feel like the music on Twilight Zone. You know, you know woo, which is gone, you know, absolutely away out there. And, oh, man, it was, it was awfully conflictual. But I didn't particularly care for the prescription drugs because I didn't like that lack of control. I really loved alcohol. I mean, whatever I could get my hands on. It just did something to me, and I looked at it, on it as a sort of a celebration type of thing first and it was fun in the beginning parts and then it didn't get fun and um, anyway they were also saying go to meetings and I didn't think there was anything at these meetings that I could absorb because I already you know had done a lot of study and different things about things that looked like the steps like theology and spirituality and stuff almost missed this deal and then they said I had to read the book oh god the book so they gave me this big fat blue book and oh I read the book and English was one of my main subjects that I was involved in and I didn't care for the way they wrote the book you know the sentences were not that well constructed and what I did was I took the book down to Huntington Beach in December and I sat up on one of the, where the lifeguards sit because he's not there in December and I corrected the book for anybody's information and I fixed the paragraphs and I put in semicolons and commas and all. And I, I brought it down to Serenity Hall and I had, God help me, I told them this, you know? Oh, so embarrassing. And they, they were very kind to me in Serenity Hall. They said, just keep coming back, B, you know, just, oh. And then they said I had to get a sponsor. Now, again, because of my, you know, not wanting to take direction from anybody, what I did was I interviewed several women and um, <laughs> hired them on, didn't care for them very much, and then I got rid of them when they weren't doing it the way they're supposed to. I did a lot of sponsors in the first few years. It was really embarrassing. And then they told me that I had to get involved with these steps. Now, I can remember distinctly saying to somebody, I will not, not be taking the fourth step. I won't be doing that. <laughs> that was, I just was, I really wanted to be different in the program, you know, and I really wanted to be unique, and I, I thought there must be some holy spiritual way that somebody like me with this disease was able to do and not do it the way everybody else did it. And I, I kept struggling with that for a long time in the program, not drinking but not surrendering, if you know what I mean. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lady in, in Huntington Beach or someplace said to me one time, B, you're kind of in between surrenders. Ooh, that's a, that's a real uncomfortable place to be. I went into Serenity Hall one day and I was crying. In fact, they, they used to call me the crying nun, but I, I didn't know that. If I had known they were calling me that, I wouldn't have gone back, you know, and, to show them, you know, how terrible it was. And this older member of the program, he since passed away, and he said, you know, B, th this program is supposed to help us to be happy, joyous, and free, the theme for your conference. And I just, I couldn't get it. I couldn't, I couldn't understand where people would tell you real huge problems, you know. And, and then they would say, but it was okay. Oh God, what's wrong with them? You know, I mean, it's just, everything seemed to be okay and they were all comfortable. They were talking about being comfortable and a degree of comfort. And I couldn't catch on to that part at all. And this man said to me, you know, I'm going to tell you something that might work for you. And he told me this like it was a big secret. And I always pass it on because it always works for me when I get stuck in sobriety. You know, when you get stuck in sobriety, when there's just one other little surrender that you have to make and you don't want to, and your old ideas start creeping in again and your character defects are bright and shining on the bottom of your bed when you wake up. You have th days sometimes like that. Um, he said, why don't you, when you go home, why don't you kneel down and ask God to give you the willingness to change your attitude? And I think that might work for you. And he wasn't being sarcastic or facetious or anything. He was just like telling me this, like that this was a real recipe.
And so I went home and I did that one simple act that I was given. And I would love to tell you, because I like to be dramatic, that there were angels in the sky and there was a burning bush and God appeared to me and all of that. But what happened to me was I was driving on the freeway in deep traffic and I happened to look out of the rear view mirror uh, window and I saw the sunset. And it occurred to me that I had never even seen a sunset in Southern California. And it occurred to me at the same moment that I hadn't been thinking of drinking for several days. I was always like, you know, Willie Nelson's song, You're Always on My Mind. (laughs) I was always like that. Always like it was always here, present to me. And it hadn't occurred to me for several days to drink or to desire a drink or to crave a drink. And then I knew, then I knew that the merciless obsession had been lifted from me. And then I knew that the miracle had begun to happen. And I got very excited. I got very excited about this deal that we're given. And I find that any time that I get stuck and I do that one simple little action, For me, you may not have to do it this way, but it works for me best this way. And my problem usually is that when I'm stuck, I never want to get unstuck. I want to stay there for another little while because that's kind of comfortable. I'm used to negativity, you know. I'm used to that. And I found what the problem was on page 62. And I'm sure I've mentioned this to a number of you lots of times that if you notice that the word self, selfishness, and self-centeredness is mentioned on page 62, 13 times. And it's the same in Texas, I think that's a sign. (laughs) You know, it's got... I was very confused about what that could mean because, you know, I'd given my whole life up to be selfless. And uh, a lady in the Pomona area explained it to me very easily one day. And she said to me, B, it means count yourself, you're not so many. (laughs) Count yourself, you're not so many. You're not in charge of the universe. Everything doesn't revolve around how you feel, how you are, how you'll be, what they think, what they do. You see, I always thought selfishness had to do with hoarding everything to yourself and you wouldn't share. And I always shared You know, that wasn't my problem at all. My problem was that I wanted everything to revolve around me, the way that I thought it ought to be, the way I always thought it ought to be. And if they didn't do it that way, they were in for a lot of trouble, just like the book says. And then if you notice, as I know many of you know this very well, on the last paragraph there on page 62, it says this to me. It says, B, this is the how and the why of it. You have to quit playing God because it doesn't work. And hereafter in this drama of life, God is going to be your director. Oh, imagine. See, I thought I thought I was Mrs. God, you know? I wear this ring on my finger. That, uh, inside of it, it says, my God and my all. I took, got this ring when I made my final vows, you know. But it never occurred to me that I was supposed to, you know, turn my will and my life over to the care of God. No, that didn't occur to me at all. And uh, God's going to be the director, and he's the principal. You're his agent. He's the father. You're his child. And then it says, B, most good ideas are simple. Almost didn't get it either because it's so simple that I can't get it. You know, I forget. I forget how to do this thing for myself. And this concept that God's in charge is the is the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which you will pass to freedom. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you all ever wanted in your life, but all I ever wanted was to feel the way I'm feeling at this moment, which is inner freedom inner freedom and then if you look at the top of page 63 it says you know B when you sincerely take this position all sorts of remarkable things will follow (laughs) and I got very interested and involved in this book that I corrected Uh, I mean not in the unrevised version (laughs) my own and uh, I, I really 
I got into finding the promises that were stuck in there in the steps in the book. And I found out that there are 13 promises in step three in the big book on page 63. The first one is at the bottom of page 62. And it says such things as, you know, God, you become more God conscious. You lose your fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. You will stop being as interested in yourself and your own little plans and designs. And you'll be more interested in what you can contribute to other people. It gives all that. And then a wonderful promise in step three. It says, we, we will discover that we can face life successfully. Now, they discovered that a long time ago, whoever they were, and they would say such things as, you know, they talk to people like us about our potential. Do you ever hear that word used? Your potential. We weren't, you know, working according to our potential. And uh, then we would do some good things, and they think we were good sometimes, but we never felt good. The outsides and the insides never matched. And the great deal that we get here is to move from problem life into solution life. I always say that there's three kinds of recovery, and, um, you know, it's a personal opinion, and you don't have to listen to this if you don't want to. But what I notice now, especially as I travel the world, that uh, this is for Australia, this part, um, they move into, um, you know, they get into AA or Al-Anon or some of the 12-step programs, and then they move into relationships. You don't do that here in the Antelope Valley. I know that. <laughs> you know, and they do low life for a while, and they stay sober, and everything's fine. And then they go into, like, a sort of in-between surrender time, like ho-hum. When things get sort of complacent after about five years, you know, and things just kind of get... People get bored. If we don't shine this deal up, it gets boring. You know, we have to keep, we have to keep being of service. We have to keep shining it up. And then there's this deal called, what I call, um, what, what, what Dr. Paul calls the panache. He describes the panache as when the French soldiers went to war. And they wore the, this helmet that had a feather. Uh, that flared and, and distinguished them as the uh, French army. And it was, it was something special. It, it was something that really marked them. And there are people in this program who walk their talk and have the panache. And a lot of them are in this room. And I know a lot of them. I'm very privileged to have been with them and walked with them for a number of years now who, uh, you know, when we get to live comfortably in our own skins with unresolved problems, I think that's what classy or panache sobriety is about. Things are not perfect, but we can deal with them. We can have a, an attitude of acceptance, and that's a wonderful spot to be in. I found the promises in, in uh, step four exciting. It says that we'd be able to match calamity with serenity. What a concept, you know, not, not to equal it. With all the calamity that we have, we'll be able to match it with serenity. And a um, marvelous thing in, in the step four promises, it gives the great fear prayer that I've often shared with the fellows here who come on the men's retreat. You know, the fear prayer says, we ask God to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And it goes like this. God, remove my fear and direct my attention to what you would have me be. And uh, <laughs> I always thought it was what I'm supposed to do. You know, I never thought it would have to be anything about being, you know, being. I never dealt with that part at all. When uh, I saw the ten promises in step five, and one of them was a wonderful one. It says we can look the world in the eye. You know, we don't, and our fears will fall from us. And isn't it a marvelous thing for people like us to be able to look the world in the eye? But what I really want to tell you is that I found God, the God that I understand today, when I took steps six and seven. Uh, somebody calls them the forgotten steps. You know, when I became uh, ready to have my defects of character removed. I had found them. That was quite a miracle, you know, that I wasn't arrogant enough to think that I hadn't done my defects of character. And then uh, I asked God to remove my defects of character. And I used the prayer in the big book on page 76. 
And this is what it says, and I know you know this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. And I want you to know that God appeared to me. Not physically, but I had an experience of God at that moment. And, and I, it was like I heard God saying, B, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure that you don't have to be perfect for me anymore? That you don't have to be proving yourself to me anymore? That you don't have to be, you know, that you don't have to be in this conflict trying to exaggerate what you're, who you are. Always trying to exaggerate who I was. And, um, it occurred to me that really my purpose in life, in order to become happy, joyous, and free, was to be full-time B. Full-time, the person that God created me to be. And it was interesting to me when I thought about that, because I think that the person that God created me to be was to be happy, joyous, and free. I believe that that's God's will for me. And so God's will and my will happen to be in sync today. And that's quite a miracle. I'm not in conflict with that at all. And then it, I also knew when I found this step seven prayer, I also knew what I had been mouthing to people for years before but didn't know what I was talking about. And I was telling them, you know, your God loves you so much that he would carve you on the palm of his hand or he would call you by your name or he would he would store up your tears and put them into a little bottle I used to tell people that sort of thing or your God would rejoice over you and would dance over you but I never thought that God would ever do that over me because I had freckles you know <laughs> or because I just you know didn't feel quite fitting and, and a great word we have in our particular church is the word worthy wasn't quite worthy and was striving really hard to be worthy and when I found step seven I just knew for sure that God loved me anyhow and it didn't matter and I never ever ever had to prove anymore and uh, I had to just give myself to God uh, good and bad and it was a, a marvelous spiritual awakening um, it, it, it almost brings me to a real emotional level to remember that because um, it was very profound for me, very profound. Um, I have loved the promises of steps eight and nine, um, like they're mentioned in the big book, you know, a new freedom and a new happiness, and we won't regret the past, don't regret a bit of it, shut the door on it. We know the word serenity, we know peace, no matter how far down we've gone, you know, no matter, and we suddenly realize that God's doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I have this realization every single day of my life. I um, was telling the sisters as I was leaving yesterday, they were asking me, they'd love to know about what group I'm with, and I, I said, I'm with the group that all the guys come down every December. I said, oh my God, that means, you know, she'll be high for about three days afterwards, and <laughs> they won't be able to get any good out of me. And um, it's, it's just, and I said to them, God's doing for me what I could never do for myself. You know, that's just too bad. Sorry for you all. <laughs> and uh, then the promises in step 10 were fascinating to me. Step 10, you know, wh when we look at step 10, we look at the, the maintenance steps, we call them. And one day, Elizabeth over here, she gave me a tape, uh, for one of Frank Sinatra's tapes, and it was called, How Do You Keep the Music Playing? How do you keep the music playing in this deal? How do you keep it shining and bright and alert and fresh and not boring? How do you do that? And I, we're told how we do that in steps 10, 11, and 12. And um, I just know that step 10 works. Uh, we have to promptly admit it, you know, when we're wrong. I don't like doing that very much. Um, I don't know whether you like apologizing when you're wrong. Uh, some of you know my co-worker, Father John, and um, I offended him the other day. I you know, blew off steam a little bit. And I had to apologize. Oh, I didn't want to do that. But God was so good to me. I called him up to do this, and he wasn't home. Thank you, God. <laughs> and his tape was on, so I did it on the tape. <laughs> Does that count? And somebody said, direct amends, you know. But uh, that's steps eight and nine, you know, so I 
So I just said, John, I'm really sorry I hurt your feelings or that I said the wrong thing, blah, 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 you know, get over it fast. And I was hoping, I was hoping that he'd forget it and never mention it again. And he said, I, thank you very much for your phone call. I, I really appreciated your amends. And I thought, I wanted him to make his. You know what I mean? It's real hard when the other side doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and we're taught in the program that the amends are for us, they're not for them. And uh, But what I discovered in step 10 was that any time I can ever be uncomfortable today or I can ever be sort of out of sorts or edgy or as the earlier part of the book says, restless, irritable or discontented, if, I can ever, if I'm like that today it's because of the four things, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear, that's all. I mean, I can tag any way I feel onto those four things at any given time. And uh, the book gives me the perfect remedy and recipe. It says we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with somebody immediately. We make amends quickly. And then we resolutely turn to see who is it we can help. And we're given the code then of the program, which is love and tolerance of other people is our code. I'm always embarrassed to tell you that I used to teach prayer meditation to people um, before I got sober. And uh, I found the simplest way to pray on page 86 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because it tells somebody like me what I'm supposed to do from the minute I wake up. It says we can sit or, you know, think about the 24 hours a day. We just think Sunday, you know. You don't have to go into Christmas and New Zealand in November or whatever it is I'm doing. You know, just, you don't have to do any of that stuff. But I'm always wanting to figure it all out. And in my head, uh, I have a friend who says, my head would destroy me if it didn't need me for transportation. <laughs> See, I don't ever think of drinking today, but I do occasionally think of having a think. You know what I mean? Do you crave a think at a definite time each day? <laughs> Have you ever felt remorse as a result of thinking? <laughs> Have you ever wanted to think the next day? <laughs> Have you ever been hospitalized for thinking? <laughs> If you apply the 20 questions we have to the word thinking, it's incredible how we do thinking today. You know, this negative thinking that's so much part of our, the fabric of our being, especially the fear. It's just part of us. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to get into what it is that, you know, how we can change those tapes, how we can maintain. The first promise of step 10 is a miracle. It says we cease fighting me from the north of Ireland, cease fighting everything and everybody, even alcohol. And one of my favorite promises on page 85 is we feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. That means I'm somewhere in there between the doormat and the bulldozer. <laughs> I never knew about that part until I found Alcoholics Anonymous because I either was never able to speak for myself or I spoke too much for myself. There's a wonderful spot there. It's a very free spot where we can stand tall, look the world in the eye, and tell the truth today. Isn't that fantastic? I, you know, you couldn't buy this. You can't buy this with money. You just can't. Uh, and, and in step 11, it just says, you know, B, when you're agitated, this is what you have to do. When you're undecided, this is what you have to do. It gives all the recipes. And then it says, you know, uh, you'll be free from worry, anxiety, fear, foolish decisions. And uh, the, the payoff will be that you will be much more efficient when you let God take your life over. It's, it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous program. I'm always amazed at how step 12 works. I never quite figured it out yet. Um, I just know it does. It works through getting together what you've done here. It works through sponsorship. It works through participation at meetings. It works through um, just sitting at a meeting, um, sharing your experience, strength, and hope, helping others. It, it just works. And I never understood uh, the way it works. And it never works the way I thought it should. Um, sometimes when I hear people talking, I think, oh, I wish to God that shut up, like I'm sure some of you are thinking right now. And, um, and I'm going to in a second. But it's really mysterious to me, because as I'm taking inventory of what somebody shouldn't be doing or saying, 
God is awakening somebody over in the corner. You know what I mean? And I'm just thinking, oh, this is so profound. This is not the way I would have thought. It doesn't work like anything else I've ever noticed. Uh, when I say that, when I say the word mystery, it reminds me of a line or two from the Shakespeare play, King Lear, and when he's talking to his daughter before she goes into prison, they're both going into prison, and he says to her, we shall laugh and pray and sing and tell old tales and look at gilded butterflies and tell of court news who's in and who's out and take upon ourselves the mystery of things as though we were God's spies. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you and I take upon ourselves the mystery of things as though we are God's spies. And we see God showing off in a zillion ways and and, and in a zillion times and in places that we would never, ever have thought. I'm deeply grateful to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous It has given me life. It has given me love. It has given me hope. It has committed me a thousand times more to the life that I'm living. And I'm, if I had to live till I'm a thousand years old, which I know I won't, I wouldn't have enough days to express my gratitude. And I want to tell you again how much I love you and how wonderful it feels to be back with you again and to ask God's blessing on every single one of you. I love you all. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.